Hi, I'm Dr. Craig Goodmurphy, and I'll be doing the introduction to the machine and mechanics of the ultrasound. Uh, as pre-hospital providers, you are on the front lines of saving people's lives. And the more information that you can bring to bear for doing your job well and getting that information to the hospital for the patients that are going to be arriving there as soon as possible, uh, the better off those patients will be. And this is one tool to help affect that change. So here's what our objectives are going to be, and we're gonna divide it into two short portions. Part one, which is what we're doing now, and part two, which is what we'll follow up with. The part two component will look at um, some more basic foundations and also looking at artifacts and textures of tissues. Let's get started. One of the things that we're trying to do is add some Sono skills to your toolbox, but we also want to ensure that you're Sono savvy. So maybe you can't create every image, but you can at least interpret those ultrasound images a little bit better because of those skills that you've learned during this program. So what is POCUS? POCUS stands for Point of Care Ultrasound. It's also known as bedside ultrasound. However, point of care could be in the field, which is why POCUS is more appropriate for the pre-hospital uh, provider. And it really, it's a set of skills, knowledge, and attitudes that we're trying to get a pre-hospitalist uh, um, savvy with and skilled with in order to perform limited diagnostic and therapeutic ultrasound wherever the patient's being treated. Now, that's a little bit different than a comprehensive ultrasound exam, which is done by the sonographer, the professional ultrasound specialist. Let's start with an idea of what ultrasound is. Human hearing is sound, and it's between 20 and 20,000 hertz, or cycles per second. Ultrasound is anything above 20,000 kilohertz, and Infrasound is anything below 20 hertz. But when we're talking about diagnostic ultrasound, we're actually talking about not about thousands of hertz, but millions of cycles per second, so megahertz. And ultrasound can be anywhere from one megahertz to 80 megahertz in some of the high-end research-based probes. Typically, diagnostic ultrasound is anywhere from 2 to 15 megahertz as typical. And really, we have some examples in nature where it's not so crazy to be seeing things with sound. So how does something that you'll see about all the different machines is they'll come in various shapes, sizes and prices. There's some of the uh, teaching machines, which would be more like a Sonosite M Turbo, about $25,000. And then you can get into various levels of teaching machine from forty dollars to $70,000, depending on the bells and whistles you want. The more you pay, the more um, uh, computing power and the more options you tend to get for, for adjustments, whether that's pre-processing or post-processing adjustments. You're going to get more options for your um, focal points and whatnot. Some of the really fancy systems can be up to a quarter million dollars and we'll have a lot of options and maybe even 3D or 4D uh, computing packages that will allow you to do various extra things that are not really part of point of care ultrasound. In the pre-hospitalist components, you're going to have a lot of the handheld machines which have a mu much more mobility and are gonna be kind of a quick and dirty look at specific things for point of care ultrasound and may not have all of the adjustments that you would have in some of the more expensive machines, which are of course less portable. And there's lots of different versions of this. Lumify is the one that's shown here. Uh, Butterfly is a company that specializes in only handhelds, but each of the big companies typically have them. There's a GE version, the V-Scan. Uh, there's going to be Sonosite versions. This is a Philips version seen here, and so on and so forth. They tend to be in around the four to 5,000 range. Uh, and of course, that's changing all the time. Um, some of them may require a monthly fee like the butterfly. So you have to have a cloud-based service and you have to think about where do you wanna store your images as part of that. Do you want them to be in the cloud or do you want them to be on the machine? 
There's also ways you can learn and practice ultrasound with software like Sonosim, which offers a relatively inexpensive way of putting uh, knowledge and practice pathologies that you can scan in a volumetric sense uh, on your system. And that's another method of refining your interpretation and uh, acquisition skills, as well as learning about the knowledge component of ultrasound point of care. They tend to have fairly similar things. Of course, they'll all be having a probe or a transducer, as it's otherwise known. They'll have different presets, which are really fancy algorithms for setting up basic control. Uh, and they'll have limited computing power, limited frame rates, limited memory, limited battery power. Those are all the things you want to consider when you're purchasing a machine of what needs do you have for your particular scanning situation. They'll all have a screen, a keyboard, whether that's virtual or real. They'll have some knobs or knobology. The more you spend on a system, the more controls and adjustments you can make to it. Although some of the major and basic controls are the same, they're just in different locations. So typically, if you understand basic ultrasound and have done some of the adjusting, you can walk up to any machine and try to find all of those various features that will exist on that machine. Each of them will have a central processing unit. Again, the more computer you pay for, the more processing it will be able to handle. And as computing in general gets better, this has made things smaller and smaller with better and better images across all of the machines themselves since the technology is moving so quickly. They'll have batteries and storage and mobility uh, components, whether that's a cart or whether that's a, a pocket that you'll be putting it in. Lots of change is coming in the terms of uh, what's available, how powerful it is, and how the quality of the images has been improving. When we think about sound, we need to understand a few key terms about how it works. Sound is a very interesting beast. We know that elephants use infrasound to send low frequency waves through miles and miles of the earth, then they'll pick them up with their feet. Bats can only use localized signals because they use high frequency sounds and they get a much better picture and more detail about what they're seeing around them, but they can't do it from very far away. So you've heard the expression being blind as a bat. Well, that's because they don't have much perception even in their sound field around them. So likewise, low frequency probes are gonna let us get deeper images, but have less resolution in the message. High frequency probes will get us more Im image information and have prettier pictures, but will have shallower resolution ranges from which it can do that. Sound is an interesting animal. Unlike light, where the velocity is constant or the speed of light is constant, the speed of sound changes based on what it's traveling through. So it's a set speed for a given medium based on the density and stiffness of that medium. And when you have a structure moving through one object to another object and they have different density and speeds, that creates impedance, which will cause sound to bounce back to its source. Let's look at a couple tissue items so in your lungs, the air is a 330 meters per second velocity. Blood is very similar to water, which would have a 1,570 meters per second velocity. Fat is a little bit slower at 1,460. Muscle, closer because it's a bloodier structure and has more water in it, would be 1,580. And bone has a very high velocity of 3,500. So there's quite an impedance change when you go from soft tissues to bone. And there's a very large impedance difference when you're in air. So air does not carry sound as well as some of the other structures that we'll be looking at. They average these with the computer to 1,540 meters per second. And we know that can't be true because the average is not what all the tissues are made up of, but that's how the computer will calculate distances and times based on traveling through those uh, soft tissues, bone, or air. Now that means that the probes that we use have to be 
picked correctly based on what we're scanning through and the properties that we want it to have. So there are probes for all various occasions. Let's think about how the machine is producing a picture, those little gray pictures that we've all seen on, let's say, the uh, sonogram that's done on an early pregnancy. We start out with an electrical impulse that's fired through a probe, which fires crystals to produce sound. And then there'll be a pulse time on as that sound goes through the actual object. And it will hit an impedance change and bounce some sound back to the probe where it will be turned back into an electrical impulse and the time will be registered. And the longer it takes for the sound to get back, the further away that white pixel will be put on the screen. And that generates by putting those white pixels all over the images that we see. So the image is an interpretation by the computer and applying various algorithms, which are the presets and adjustments. It's limited by the processing of the computer and the frame rate. So we have to be careful of not taking up too much processing time based on our settings. And then it's gonna construct an image that's put onto a digital screen where longer return times for the sound coming back to the probe will be a deeper pixel into the screen. So it's those piezoelectric crystals that will vibrate. And that means that ultrasound is both a speaking and a listening device. It speaks or chirps sound less than 1% of the time. And it's listening and timing the sounds return back to the probe 99% uh, of the time. Now let's talk about the ultrasound terminology that will help us understand and interpret images. First, we'll talk about the images that are created. So here we can see two images, one of the neck on top and one of a knee down below. If we think about the image itself, we think of the near field being the top half and the far field being the bottom half of the image. And the focal point for the machine tends to be in the middle, although with a more expensive machine, you can change this with some of the buttons and knobs. When we discuss each tissue inside the image, something without echogenicity is known as anechoic, like these blood vessels seen here. Everything else has sound bouncing back from it, so it has an echogenic profile or a sound profile. Those could be hyperechoic if they're brighter intensities or hypoechoic if they're a lower dark intensity, and these tend to be comparative terms. So the muscles seen here in the neck are actually more hypoechoic than the thyroid seen here in the neck, which is more hyperechoic. Other comparative things would be if it has a similar or a different echogenicity. For instance, the thyroid that we just circled has quite a homoechoic or same nest to it, and therefore it's homoechoic. If it was a mixed echogenicity, like this area seen here where there's some tendon and some fluid, that would be a mixed or heteroechoic echogenicity. Other things that are happening with sound is attenuation, which is always happening. Even if you step further away from the speakers that you're listening to this with, you would have an attenuation of the sound as you get further away. The ambulance that EMS drives to a scene in has an attenuation as it drives away from you. So uh, the artifacts that you see are things that are not real that shouldn't be on the screen but are, so they're not real. You have to interpret them in a couple different planes for it to be real, and that's something that we use in all medical imaging. What are the other ways where the signals can be attenuated? Well, we've talked already about being far away or close to the object, it will attenuate, so as it takes longer time, there may be more sound that reflects away from the object, so reflection can take away echogenicity. It can scatter, 
If the object is rough, it will scatter it away from the ret return of the probe. Therefore, it will look like there's not as much coming back to the probe. Or it can absorb the sound as heat energy, which is what happens to things when there's a big impedance change, like between soft tissue and bone. And there are many other ways that signal can be attenuated, but basically there is less energy with time and less uh, sound coming back to the probe shows up as attenuation. When we think about the probe fo profiles that we'll be using, you should be familiar with probably three to four of these key probes that are used in ultrasound. The linear probe, notice how the image has a square profile because the probe would shoot straight out and produce an image that matches the square profile. This is a linear probe. It has a high frequency, up to 16 megahertz for this particular probe, which will give us better resolution, but will not give us as good of penetration. It has a nice flat footprint, uh, but that means that it's not very good for very bony objects in some places because it loses a signal. Then we have a linear probe that's been bent, so it's called curvilinear. So it has a wedge-shaped image profile. Notice how it comes out like a wedge, almost like an ice cream cone with a bite out of the top. It's much lower frequency, two to five megahertz. Therefore, it's gonna have a lot better penetration for seeing deeper structures. And this is a favorite for abdominal or pelvic ultrasound. But it's not gonna have as good a resolution, especially in that bottom half or the far field of the image. It does provide some nice grayscale resolution for relatively still structures. So if you're scanning a liver or a gallbladder or a kidney, they're not moving very much. So you can have better grayscale resolution. But if you're scanning a heart, this may not be the probe with the presets that you'd wanna start with. It does give you a nice large window because of that very large footprint that it has across it. But it's not going to be great for superficial structures because there's not great resolution in the near field. And as you get further away, the lines of sound start to deviate, so you get even further uh, resolution degradation. Now we have the face array probe. This one works like a windshield wiper in that it sweeps across the footprint, which is quite small back and forth to create the image. So it looks like it's a piece of pie or wedge shaped without the bite coming from the top. It is more of a cone shaped profile. Again, it tends to be the lowest of the frequencies for these particular probes, really good for deep structures. And because it has a small footprint, you can get through narrow spaces like between ribs. So it's good for cardiac ultrasound. That's sometimes known as a cardiac probe. It has good temporal resolution for moving things like the heart valves, but it's not gonna have as nice of grayscale resolution in order to keep the frame rate good. So this is not gonna be good at all for um, uh, superficial structures because everything's kind of crammed in into the cone the closer it is to the surface. And the final one, which we won't, of course, be using in the field at all, is the intracavitary probe, or sometimes known as a transvaginal probe. However, in a pinch, if this is the only thing you've got, you could use this almost like a linear probe. It has a medium frequency, but it has a very tight wedge, and it looks like there's a half a moon taken out of the top of it but it's good for shallow structures, which is why it's an invasive use of this particular probe, um, but gives you good pictures and good resolution. So we won't focus on this particular one, uh, that it tends not to come in any of the uh, portable handheld machines. So when you're working with the probe, you have to know how to handle it and what the different parts are. We can see a head, a neck and shoulders, a body and a tail, and then the footprint is down at this side. 
If we look the other way on this particular linear probe, we can see that it has a long and a short axis. And that whole base there that touches the person or the person you're scanning is known as the footprint. And at the back of it is the heel and near this little probe marker is the toes. When you're thinking about moving this particular probe, you don't want to hang the cord over your neck or around some objects that uh, could get twisted or knotted up. Uh, you want to think about having good, secure scanning by three points of contact. Don't be afraid to get some gel on you. And you shouldn't be holding it way up high up in here. You should be holding it down quite low so that you can anchor well. And please use plenty of gel. When we're moving the probe, we're going to have cardinal movements. But here you can see this probe is floating. They're not touching the person. This one, they're holding it down low, but they're still not touching the, the patient. And there's the way you want to hold it, where they've got three points of contact. That's a nice stable probe. The cardinal movements we'll see as short axis slide or a long axis slide, which is along the shorter long axis of the probe footprint. Fanning, which is pivoting the probe around its long axis. Rotating or pivoting, which is circling the probe around a center point. And then toe or heel pressure, which is in line with the long axis uh, based on where the probe marker is. Heel is on the away from the probe marker. Toe pressure would be towards the probe marker. And then by convention, we're going to start thinking about the fact that that probe marker, whatever side it's on, should be to the patient's right or towards the patient's head, to the right or to the head. And we'll think about some basic scanning conventions as well. So probe marker to the patient's right or towards their head. The top of the screen image is what the probe is closest to. And then the deeper into the screen is where the images are. So here is what the probe is touching. This is a bladder shot. And then it's going deeper into the shot with this curvilinear image. Here we can see an anechoic bladder. And we can see a prostate in this particular individual. So this is a male. Not scanned up here, but scanned below the belly. And you want to try to keep the structures that you're interested in towards the center of the screen. So this person should be focusing on these components of the anatomy for this particular scan. Now let's orient you to side. So if this is anterior and this is not a transvaginal probe, then this would be the skin at the top. So we have skin and subcutaneous tissue. Then we can see muscle. And then we see thyroid. In the midline, we actually have the trachea. And this is the tracheal ring coming across here. And now we have an artifact. We know there shouldn't be anything in this trachea. And we'll talk about those artifacts a little bit later. And then we see nothing. We know that there should be something behind the trachea somewhere in here. But we're not seeing it because it's creating an artifact known as a sound shadow. And then we have the leading edge, which is towards the probe marker side. Or if you're away from the probe marker, this would be the receding edge. And in this particular person, this would be to the right, and this would be the left thyroid lobe. When we're doing long axis, now this is going towards the head. And doing a long axis scan, again, we would have the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and we see the tendon of the, the knee, the patellar tendon. And we would have the cranial side in this case, also known as the leading edge still, or the caudal towards the feet side, which would be the receding edge. And again, the deeper we go in and place a pixel at this location, it took longer than all of the pixels and sound coming back to the probe above it. That's all we have for this part one. We'll see you in part two. I'm Dr. Craig Goodmurphy. Talk to you soon.